Hey guys, before we get to the show, got a quick favor to ask for you. Our latest book, The Illustrated Art of Manliness, is now available in bookstores everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and even some independent booksellers. You enjoy this podcast, have gotten something out of it. I'd really appreciate it if you go out and buy a copy today. That really helps us out a lot. It's a great way to support The Art of Manliness. Think of it as giving a donation to your local public radio station, but instead of a tweet tote bag, you're going to get a, a manly tome full of awesome illustrated how-tos on all sorts of man skills, like how to fire a gun, how to tie a tie, how to straight razor shave. There's a lot more in there, so go check it out. So you can find more information about the book at illustrated.artofmanliness.com slash book, or just Google Illustrated Art of Manliness. You'll find links to buy it. So go out there, buy a copy. It's a great graduation gift, a great Father's Day gift. Thank you so much for your support. So without further ado, on with the show. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. While the first manned flight took place in 1903, it wouldn't be until World War I that aeronautical advances were made that would turn aviation into more than just a county fair spectacle. While many men contributed to moving man flight forward, and many men lost their lives in the process, during this period, there were three men in particular who stood out. Eddie Rickenbacker, Jimmy Doolittle, and Charles Lindbergh. All three men made important contributions to aviation before, during, and after World War I, and all three men became financially successful world famous celebrities. When World War II erupted, all three men were middle-aged and wealthy. They could have easily sat out the war while younger men fought, but they all answered the call to duty and provided their talents as ace aviators to the Allied cause. My guest today on the podcast wrote a history of Rickenbacker, Doolittle, and Lindbergh. His name is Winston Groom. He's authored numerous history and historical fiction books, including Forrest Gump, probably heard of that one, as well as the subject of today's show, The Aviators, in which he details the engaging history of these three pioneers of flight and their service to their country. Today on the show, we discuss each of these men and their respective heroics, from Lindbergh's famous flight across the Atlantic, to Doolittle's legendary raid on the Japanese, and to Rickenbacker's survival at sea for 23 days during World War II. We also dig into their complex characters, and specifically Lindbergh's testy relationship with the press, and how his initial opposition to the U.S. entering World War II got him labeled a traitor by FDR. Winston is a masterful storyteller, so you're in for a real treat today. You're going to be left both entertained and inspired by these three men. After the show's over, check out the show notes at aom.is slash aviators, where you can find links to resources where we can delve deeper into this topic. Winston Groom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you are a, a prolific writer of history, historical fiction. I'm sure our listeners are familiar with Forrest Gump. One that I just read, just walked away, blown away, because I knew very little about this part of American history. Uh, the book is The Aviators, where you focus on three pioneers of aviation, James Doolittle, Charles Lindbergh, and Edward Rickenbacker. Before we get into these, these, the lives of these men, their contributions to aviation, I think it's important for our listeners to have a little bit of background to what aviation was like before they came on the scene during World War I. What was flying like before World War I? And, I mean, did it serve any practical purpose? It was the kiss of death. It was the kiss of death. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, they were learning by doing. You know, there wasn't really, there was no aeronautics or anything. And, and you know, once you get up in three dimensions, you, you, you're in a whole different scale of things. And there's a lot of things that go on up there that don't go on here on Earth, uh, in a you know, four-wheel car. And uh, so they they had to learn this stuff, literally see in the pants, what to do and what not to do. And so a great many of these people perish. I mean, one that comes to mind that I wrote about in my my novel El Paso is that I can't remember her name now. Great aviatrix, and she she died because she wasn't wearing a seat belt because of an argument at that point. Uh, I'm guessing around what 1910. One of the seat belts were were dangerous because if you crashed and burned, you couldn't get out of the plane. So she was a exhibition over Boston Harbor, and the plane turned, and they both uh, she and her passenger f fell out. Uh, you know, three or four thousand feet into the into into the harbor and, and died. So that was that kind of thing. It was just it was learning by doing. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of the early years of aviation, a lot of it was just like barnstorming. It was just like shows. It was more 
just entertainment purposes, really. Aircraft was not reliable enough. And this, this actually went for after World War One as well, but it just wasn't reliable enough for passenger service uh, because you the, the, the weather was a, was a deciding factor. And things like fog caused the pilot simply to bail out. I mean, there was no, you know, if you go into a fog, there's no telling what you're going to find because your instruments weren't, weren't uh, accurate enough. And Doodle will solve that problem. But uh, that, that was much later. And so, uh, you, you, you know, you couldn't have, a, say, a flight from even Cleveland to uh, Chicago because you couldn't say it with any kind of regularity uh, whether it would, it would get there or not. Um, the mail was the first uh, test of this, uh, the U.S. Uh, air mail. And a lot of the pilots, matter of fact, they said it was basically a suicide club. <laughs> uh, about, oh, I think 70% of all the air mail pilots uh, they had back in the 1920s uh, died in crashes. So it was, it was a very risky business. Yeah, and because it was risky, did it draw a certain type of person Oh, God, yes. You know, you know, daredevils, of which there were many. You know, they, they, uh, uh, they, they were fearless people, obviously. You know, they, they had put aside that uh, notion of self-preservation for the privilege of, you know, being up in the air like Batman or something. It seems like a lot of them came, they were like race car drivers. A lot of them were race car drivers before they got into it. Yeah, that, well, of course, certainly Rickenbacker was. He was the greatest race car driver, one of the greatest, uh, before he, he took to flying. Uh, as a matter of fact, he owned the Indianapolis 500 Speedway at one point. Yeah, that's right. And we'll get into a little more detail about these, these guys, Rickenbacker and Lindbergh and Doolittle. And they all contributed to aviation in different ways. And we'll talk about the different ways they did that. But as you researched and you wrote about them, what what do you think they all had in common? I mean, I'm sure fearlessness was one, but anything other attributes they all had in common? Yeah, they had a drive to not just be better, but be the best. And it, that, uh, it, it sort of snowballed uh, along the way. As they, as they got better, they, they strived to become the, the very best. And they were the very best in, in, in what they did. And I think that that is something that doesn't limit itself just to, say, aviation, but it's uh, in, in, in all things, all matters. Excellence, I was just talking to having dinner with a pilot last night. He was a colonel in the Air Force, and he flies private planes. And he, he wondered about Einstein and what propelled him. And we started talking about it over dinner, and, you know, he, he just, he, he, he had an obvious aptitude, I understand, it, for mathematics, but he wanted to, he, he could see into the future. He literally could do that and see into outer space where the rules don't apply. There's no Newtonian physics don't apply in outer space because there's no gravity. And it, it, it's a very special thing uh, when you find such men, such people. And I thought it was interesting too. Like they all, they all came from relatively humble beginnings as well. I mean, I guess Lindbergh might have been middle class, but they were humble. Certainly, uh, well, they were. They were, and and matter of fact, they were. Uh, well, with the exception of Lindbergh, they were lower middle class. Uh, Doolittle was from California, in the Los Angeles area, and his father abandoned the family when he was very very young, and he was raised by his mother in almost impoverished circumstances. He made his way as a boxer. He was a, he was a small guy. He was only about five, six, but he was a very good boxer. He, he actually turned pro, pro professional boxer in, in California after winning the state championship. But uh, he then applied himself at the University of California and got a degree in, in uh, engineering. And ultimately he, got a degree, he got a PhD degree in aeronautical engineering from MIT, which is one of the best schools, you know, engineering school, probably is the best engineering school in the world. And so he knew whereof he spoke. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker is very similarly 
came from, he was from Columbus, Ohio, and his family had immigrated, the parents from uh, Switzerland. They were poor German Swiss who, in those times, back in say, the 1890s, I think, they, they, they could never get out of their class, which was essentially a farmer, a peasant's class. Uh, that, 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 that in Europe, that ability didn't exist. And so they immigrated to the United States. I think his mother came with a, with a note pinned on her um, saying who she was and where she's going. She didn't speak English. But uh, Rickenbacker's father was, he was killed early on in a, in a fight, again, raised by the mother. I think that, that if I'm not mistaken, Columbus was where the original soapbox derby was run, or it was somewhere there in Ohio. And he entered that, and he won that, and then he, he took the car racing. He, he uh, was fascinated with the automobile. And as we talked about a minute ago, he, he became, uh, I think he was third in the, in the world somewhere along the way, they measured that. He, in, in World War One he, he wanted to get into the war. He, he was very famous by then as a race car driver. Somehow finagled his way into becoming a, a driver. You know, they, they made him a sergeant, and he was a driver of Billy Mitchell, who was a famous aviator who was court-martialed for promoting aviation too strongly. And uh, through Billy Mitchell, he he got to be a, a pilot um, and, and then wound up sh- shooting down um, more German planes than any, any other American, at least, and became the ace of aces. And Lindbergh was probably raised in a more financially secure position. His father was a congressman and had actually done very well, but then he, he lost his money, I think his father did, in some agricultural adventure, and he lost his seat in Congress and... The father sort of abandoned the family. He managed to get a little bit of college training, but again, he, he wanted to fly. He, he watched these air Minnesota or Wisconsin, I can't remember which, but he was out in the woods and look up in there and see an airplane and think, I want to do that. And he scraped up $500 to buy a, a used training plane, one of those Curtis Jennies from uh, World War I, and, and learn how to fly it himself I mean, without any training. He just thought he knew how to do it. <laughs> that's how these guys grew up. That's how, and that's how they got into flying. Well, let's talk about Rickenbacker. So he was an ace of ace, but he, in the process, he made a lot of contributions to aviation and was able to propel the force. Like, what, what exactly was Rickenbacker's role in promoting or making advances in aeronautics during World War I? Well, I, I, I don't know that he made a lot of advances in aeronautics in the... In, in the First World War, but he he certainly pushed the envelope so far as being a fighter pilot. He, he had, a, if I'm not mistaken, 21 victories, which means he he shot down 21 enemy planes. And uh, I mean, one time he tore into a squadron of seven enemy fighter planes just by himself. It, 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 he so terrified these people; they all. They all flew off in the other direction, uh, just because he was bold. But he had a he had a way of suppressing his fears to the extent that he said he never was afraid when he was there. It was always so many things to to watch out for or to do. But whenever he came down and, and landed, he would uh, he was in an aerodrome in France. It was a wall that he'd go behind the wall and and throw up, uh, and then he started to shake. And then he'd go into the office's lounge and have a drink. And that would kind of put him back on, on an even keel again until the next time. But that was, you know, it was a scary thing what he did. But then, of course, afterwards, uh, you know, he became the owner and the president of Eastern Airlines. And he did a huge amount of promoting, uh, promotion of, of uh, commercial flying. It was, it was just enormous. Yeah. He, he, he was a world-known Worldwide known figure in commercial aviation. Everybody knew Eddie Rickenbacker. Yeah, I mean that was I, I never. This is the first time I ever heard of him. But he was because of his race car driving, because of his exploits during World War One. He was this. Yeah, he was a, he was world famous. He was a celebrity. Oh God, um, yeah, I've got a set of glasses that belonged. To, I say belonged to him. He would give them out from Eastern Airlines, and it 
says compliments from Captain Eddie Regenbacher. He always wanted to be known as Captain Eddie. So he, he contributed a lot to dogfighting, like how we fight in the air, and then also commercial. Let's talk about Doolittle, because unlike Rickenbacker, who was a celebrity even before he became a nascent ace, Doolittle, he had to earn his celebrity after World War One. So what was it that Doolittle did that basically made modern aviation possible that we know today? Well, he, he was so good as a as a cadet, a flying cadet, that they made him, during World War One. they made him a, a teacher, an instructor. He never got into the action. He was furious, but that was the way it was. But he stayed in the army, stayed in the military, and uh, for, for at least for uh, till the 1930s. And at one point, he, of course, he became he became a household name because of his flying abilities. As a, they used to have uh, racers. I think they still have a few of those. But these pilots would would race around big pylons and uh, people went it was a blood sport people went to see him crash uh, you know kind of like the, these car races they have today but they in fact they did crash too much and he he won all of those prizes and at last he announced that he was getting and very publicly announced he was quitting he said i think aviation we've, we've done enough to promote aviation in these kinds of races but now we need to promote aviation safety, and this isn't the way to do it because we're, we're losing too many people. And that was pretty much the end of the big-time plane racing. But what he did was he realized, like all of them did, like Lindbergh and Ray Beckett, that the, the aviation was so limited by the weather that they needed some way to, uh, to overcome it. And the only way to overcome it was instruments. And basically what he did, what Doolittle did, was he invented, because he was a, actually a professor of aeronautical engineering with the help of the government he invented a number of instruments very basic instruments but there's still some form of these are still used in planes today that would allow you to fly blind and to prove it he went out one day on long island well out of somewhere in long island when the the big fog moved in and he pulled a canvas hood over the cockpit of his biplane this is back in the late the early 1930s he taxied and he took off and he flew for about 20 miles and he came back and he landed in a total un- under this canopy where all he could see was his instruments. And this was enormous. And it was the very beginning of commercial flight. Yeah, I mean that that I mean it's crazy that he tested it himself. Like they he I guess they invent, like he helped invent the altimeter, which allows you to know how high you are, hori- the artificial horizon. I love how you describe the radar, sort of the, the rudimentary radar they developed to let 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 a pilot know. Yeah, it was a radio signal. It, it was simply a signal that went out, and they had. <laughs> you can hardly believe it. I would risk his life on this. There were two reeds, like you have it, like an oboe or something, a reed. And the, they sent out a radio signal from a beam from the air, airdrome, airport, and you could tell how far away from the airport you were by the humming of the, these reeds as it received the signal. And so he knew when he was getting close, when the signal was, was louder and louder and louder, and then he'd look at his altimeter, he'd look at his horizon, he'd look at all, whatever else he had, and somehow he was able to put that on a runway, and that's all he had. And it was an extremely bold thing to do, but he wanted to prove a point. He was always pushing that envelope. Yeah, so by conquering the fog, he paved the way for aviation that we know today. Like, we, we're on a jumbo jet because of Doolittle. Yeah, they had a, well, they, they had a, a hotelier in Paris had put up a big prize. I think it was like fifty thousand dollars, which back then did translate today maybe a half a million, something like that. Many people had tried, and many people had died. And Lindbergh decided he was going to enter this this contest just just for the hell of it, see if he could do it. Uh, he had missed World War One, but he was in the army, run into some some army flyers. I think during the war, toward the end of the war, and they said, "Well, why don't you go and jo- you know get in the air? You know, you got a plane, you can fly it. You know, get in the army." So he did. He, he, jo- he joined up in the reserves and he flew. And then he decided he was going to enter this race. Essentially, designed his own plane after some fits and starts with trying to buy one, and took it to the, the race was from New York to Paris. You know, it wasn't from New York to Ireland that that had been done. But New York to Paris was a you know, much longer distance, and 
just as he was getting ready to start his his turn at it to try, a handful of other flyers, probably three or four, were were trying to do it. They all died. Uh, was, well, actually, some were grounded because they crashed and they didn't die, but they were hurt. The plane was hurt, and so on. And he took off and he did it. All the characters you follow in this book, I'm sure Charles Lindbergh is the most well known. And what what's interesting is, you know, he's the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic. But what I, I didn't I didn't realize this, or I should have realized this, is that there was actually a race. Like there's multiple people trying to achieve this goal. How were the other pilots going about this? I think most important, the fact that he was going to do it solo, that the, uh, the 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 bet didn't say anything about solo, and people didn't think you could do it solo because he said you fall asleep hours over the ocean and just that monotony of it he decided it, what he was going to do is have a monoplane everybody else said no you got to have a at least a biplane in case one of the engines conked out because that was very common back then to one of the engines would stop and you know pilot would put down the field or something but if you're in the middle of the atlantic that's not possible and so he he decided he was going to get a big a big curtis Wright engine and hope for the best, and he took every bit of weight, including he measured it down to the, like a piece of paper, the weight of a piece of paper, just a sheet of paper that he would scribble something on, eliminate all the excess weight, and use it for gasoline, for fuel. He, he actually couldn't even see out of the car. He, the way he, he had fuel tanks ahead of him, like if you're sitting in a cockpit, normally you'd look out the front of the cockpit. Well, he couldn't do that. He had to stick his head out the side. But he said pilots did that anyway, and he didn't need to see what, what was ahead of him because he knew it was ahead of him, water. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. All right, it's wedding season. If you are a groom who's about to get married or you're part of a wedding party and you need to get a tux, you know that renting a tux can be a big hassle. You go to the tux store, you got to get measured. The selection of tuxes usually aren't that great. Then when the wedding's over, you got to take it back. Big hassle. Wouldn't it be great if you could rent a tux and have the tuxedo delivered right to your home, try it on in your home, see if it fits without ever having to leave your house? Well, with theblacktux.com, you can do that. They have high quality rental suits and tuxedos delivered to your doorstep. And get this, the Black Tux offers free home try-on so you can see the fit and feel the quality of your suit months before the event. The best part, it's completely done online. No trips to the tux shop required. Theblacktux.com lets you create your look or choose from tons of stylists, selected outfits starting at just $95. These suits have a modern fit and are made from fine Italian wool, the highest quality on the rental market. And if you have any questions or issues, their expert customer care team has your back every step. After ordering, your suit will arrive 14 days before the event. So you have a full two weeks to try it on, make sure everything fits. If anything is less than perfect, the Black Tux will send you a free replacement right away. And when your event's over, just drop your rental back in the mail. Shipping is free both ways. How easy is that? So to get $20 off your purchase at the Black Tux, visit theblacktux.com slash manliness to get $20 off your purchase. Again, that's the Black Tux dot com slash manliness for twenty dollars off your purchase also by the Dollar Shave Club. So if you shave on a regular basis, you know that shaving can get really expensive really fast. Replacement cartridges for those multi-blade cartridges at the drugstore often cost, you know, 20, 30 bucks. And then you, when you go to the drugstore, you have to ask the manager for the key to get in that plexiglass thing so you can pick out your razor blade. Big hassle. Wouldn't it be great if you can get multi-blade cartridges sent to your door for, you know, much more cheaper, never have set foot in a drugstore again? Well, you can do that with the Dollar Shave Club. It's a great shave at a great price, conveniently delivered right to your door. Besides the razor blades, they also have other stuff there. They've got their Dr. Car shave butter. It's a shave cream that's tr- you know transparent so you can ensure you know you know where you're shaving, where you where you've missed a spot. I love it. It's it's a great shave. It's one of my go-to shaving creams. So, if you want to try the Dollar Shave Club, for a limited time, new members get their first month of the Executive Razor with a tube of their Dr. Carver Shave Butter for only $5 with free ship. After that, razors are just a few bucks a month. That's a $15 value for only 5 bucks. In your first month box, you get an awesome weighty handle, a full cassette of four cartridges, and a tube of their Shave Butter. And after your first month, replacement cartridges ship automatically at their regular price. There are no hidden fees, no commitments. Cancel anytime you like. If you'd like to get this exclusive offer, go to dollarshaveclub.com slash manliness. Again, the dollar shave, go to dollarshaveclub.com com slash manliness for five dollars free shipping you get the executive razor with the two of the doctor shave butter plus a cassette of four cartridges and now back to the show what do you think what was the difference like how was Lindbergh's approach different from these other pilots that and why was he successful when these other pilots failed was it just luck or was it like the design of the plane yeah yeah he was doing it without 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 those those kinds of instruments he was and if, if he had gotten for instance in a in a fog somewhere and over France, he would have been SOL. I mean, because, you know, fog is the most dangerous 
I mean, I, I'm a sailor, and I can tell you the fog is the most hated thing anybody on the water, because uh, you simply can't see where you are. There's no way to see. It's just you're in, a, you're in a fog is where you are. Uh, so anyway, he, his luck held out, and he he uh, flew all the way. He got to Paris. To his concern was he'd forgotten his wallet. He didn't have any money, and he's wondering if any place was going to be open where he could get something to eat. Uh, how he was going to explain to some pension or somewhere cheap hotel he could stay that he he would he would get money in the morning through American Express. And he's that was his big concern. He reached England. He could see, look down. He so he knew he was probably going to make it, but he was really worried about his circumstances when he got to Paris because he was hungry. Hey, when he got there. He couldn't believe his eyes, and he saw these. He said there must be some factory letting out because he saw these thousands and thousands of headlights of cars. This was 1927, and he looked. He, he went, descended to the airfield. So there were hundreds of thousands of people on the aerodrome, and he said, "Well, I, he didn't know where to land. They were on the runway, so he found a runway that wasn't being used." And, managed to land and he got out of the plane and all these people ran over to him and seized him and and uh, he was feared for his life and they lifted him up on their shoulders and carried him around for half an hour before some French pilots uh, somehow rescued him and got him into a building and then he was then taken to the American embassy and treated like a god and it started there this, this fame began there and it never ever ceased. Right, like he was the first like modern like worldwide mega celebrity. Yeah, I mean like big, the biggest rock star, the biggest athlete. You think back then, you know, we were in between the wars, the world was at peace, people needed heroes, and of course the press was big in that, the newspapers it created the heroes, and uh, so he, he was. Uh, fed it everywhere. He he was uh, because it didn't hurt that he was a tall, handsome, good-looking, well-spoken young man, uh, very humble, and uh, you know, uh, just a pretty much uh, everybody said a good, uh, all-around good guy. But he he was a mega hero. But he didn't really respond well to the fame. Well, yeah, he he didn't like all the celebrity. After a while, that that can wear thin. And uh, but he he was not like these movie stars who won't give an autograph. He always had time to do these things. But he his privacy. The trouble was he was so famous that his very privacy was was often. But he didn't have any privacy. And um, you know, of course, there was a horrible tragedy with his his infant son who was kidnapped and murdered. The press would, I mean, they would literally camp out wherever he was, no matter where he went, uh, when he was going to get married, when it, the press would be camped out uh, by the, the bride's home. And there was, he had, always had to disguise when he went out, you know, he would lie in the back seat of the car. And that, and that, you know, that, that can wear thin on you for after a while. Yeah, for sure. Well, they, these these three men in their 20s and early 30s, they made these fantastic contributions to aviation at, during and around World War One. But what's amazing about them is that when World War Two broke out and the U.S. entered World War Two, all three of them returned to service for their country as pilots. Yeah, they taken their ball and gone home. I mean, they, they were too old for to, to any kind of regular military service and. Uh, they they were certainly uh, well well enough established and w w extremely wealthy all of them so they, they didn't have to do this but they did it and I think that the, in the regular service because Doolittle uh, was a regular army colonel at that point uh, in the, what they call the Army Air Corps then belonged to the to the Department of the Army before they had an Air Force and he was he was at the Pentagon well it was, this is before the Pentagon. Wherever the hell their, their army was based, and Roosevelt was a very, very after Pearl Harbor, extremely adamant that we needed to strike back at Japan, and nobody knew how to do it because we had aircraft carriers, but they were, they, you know, we had fighter planes on them or fighter bombers, but they were not 
they didn't have the range to strike Japan and get back to the carrier. And even if they had, they couldn't carry a payload of bombs that would be anything that would that would be meaningful. And one day, uh, a naval captain discovered that the B-25 could fit on an aircraft carrier. And B-25 was a, what they call a medium-sized bomber, but it carried a payload that makes a difference. And Hap Arnold, the head of the Air Force, assigned Doolittle to get up a squadron of these people and go and strike Japan. And, and he did, and he trained them, and he, he did all that, and then he announced that he was going with them. And they said, no way, you're too valuable to go with them. Well, he said well, he was going to do it, and it was a finagling that went on there, and he wound up uh, leading this, this bunch, and it was an extremely bold thing that they did. Uh, he Doolittle himself was a uh, because he was so educated. He was an, uh, an odds man, and he gave them himself and everybody else less than 50-50 chance that they were going to come back alive because they had to go and get off the carrier first of all, and nobody ever done that before with a full payload of bombs of that that, that kind of plane. And then they had to get to Japan. And it was said that Tokyo had a thousand anti-aircraft weapons around, you know, the huge thing. And then they had to fly on from after that to airfields in China, um, which was supposed to have been prepared and, and weren't, in fact. And so everything seemed to go wrong. They took off from the carrier under duress because they'd been spotted. They were supposed to take off 400 miles from Japan, they took off 700 miles from Japan. The, the seas were huge. They were just an awful storm, and the waves were as high as a 30-story building. And the deck of the carrier was pitching like it was like a seesaw. But anyway, they all got off somehow, performed their mission. They they came in so low that the Japanese were so surprised they didn't they didn't expect this thing. And by the time they got to man their their anti-aircraft guns and get their fighters off the ground, doodle raiders and hit their targets and gone on. But then the, the, the biggest problem came up with the weather turned really bad uh, and the night was falling. They were supposed to have landed in daytime because the late there has landed at night. The weather was uh, huge and China, of course, is, the coast is lying with its big mountain ranges. They go way back into the interior. Nobody even knew how, how high they were because the maps couldn't be trusted. But they flew on and finally uh, do a little radio to the other planes and just fly until you run out of gas and jump out. And that's what they did. And you imagine that wasn't scary. And because half of China was, was occupied by the Japanese, and they knew probably if they were caught by Japanese, uh, they were going to be uh, executed on the spot or taken to Tokyo and executed. As some were, in fact. But most of them, they jumped out, and there were 16 planes and I think about 80 flyers. And a couple of them were killed jumping out. They landed in the wrong place. A couple, oh, about a half a dozen more were captured by the Japanese, and some of those were executed. But the majority of them, by hook or by crook, somehow, with the help of the Chinese people, were taken back to U.S. lines there and flown home in Doolittle. He, he was mortified because he thought he was going to be court-martialed because he lost all the planes. His, his whole squadron was <laughs> crashed and burned. And he got back to uh, to Washington finally. It was a big circuitous route through India. And he didn't even have proper clothes on. And General Marshall, who was the chief of staff of the Army, uh, called him in and he said, we're going to the White House. And Doodle said, what for? He said, the president's going to give you the Congressional Medal of Honor, which he did. So that was the story of the Doolittle Raid, because Doolittle became very, very famous after that. Wow, and this was Doolittle's Raid. Well, the interesting thing about Doolittle is, and the reason I wrote this book the way I did, I was going to do a biography of Doolittle. Nobody had done it. He wrote an autobiography, but I got about a third of the way into it. And I said, now I know why nobody's done a biography of Doolittle, because... The raid itself, which happened in 1942, was the biggest thing in the biography, even though, interestingly enough, he became the commanding general of every air force we had in, in, in the Atlantic theater. Well, we, we invaded North Africa. He was the commander of the 12th Air Force. And we invaded Italy. He was the commander of the 15th Air Force. We invaded... Normandy, uh, the European continent, he was commander of the 8th Air Force. 
huge, important positions. But the problem with it was Eisenhower had forbade him to fly because he knew about Ultra, which was the top secret code breaking operation going on in, in Great Britain. And they were afraid that if the Germans got him to somehow torture him, cause him to reveal this, that that would all be blown. And so his work was basically administrative, even though it was it was great work. But um, he, then he then also he lived on until he was like 95. And so I got right, and I said, you know, this book, I, I can't write this book. It's going to be dull. I said, I wish the heck he had crashed in the Pacific like Eddie Rickenbacker had. And then I thought, wait a minute, I started having an epiphany. And I said, wait a minute, how about if I write about Doolittle and Rickenbacker? And then I had another epiphany right on top of that. I said, wait a minute. If I add Lindbergh, I've got the three greatest flyers of the 20th century. I would take all three of them. They all knew each other. They were all had the World War I products one way or the, the other. And they all did you know, their thing early on in, 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 in their 20s. Um, well, no, except for Dua, but he did. He raced and did all that then. And then they all went on to World War II. I said, this, well, this is a really good story here. So that's how I came to write the book. Yeah, so start off with Doolittle. Yeah, and like going to Rickenbacker, like that was phenomenal too. Like he was this celebrity hero, wealthy, went back and he got shot down in the Pacific and he was a castaway, like in the middle of the ocean in a lifeboat. This guy, so. He, he wasn't actually shot down. He was in a B-17, and they were going to. He, he had some special message to tell General MacArthur, who was in New Guinea. And they took off in this B-17, and um, for a variety of reasons, including some, some navigational problems, they ran out of gas. And they had to put a B-17 down in an ocean with 12-foot seas. It's never been done before successfully, anyway. And they did. And they got out in these little life rafts, and the plane sunk almost immediately. And they had three life rafts. And this was early on in the war before the, the Air Corps realized what they needed to put in the life rafts. And so they had, like, they had some fishing poles and hooks, but no bait. And they had... You know, there no water, no food, no just you know, embarrassed stuff. And they, it was kind of life raft where one guy has to turn over, everybody's got to turn over. And so they went for like a week with no food, no water. People were literally dying. I mean, and all of a sudden, Rickerback is sitting there and a seagull land on his head. And because everybody stared, they're looking at that seagull, let's, let's lunch. And he slowly, slowly reached back as carefully as he could. He, seized that bird and wrung its neck, and uh, they, they divided it up. Uh, he had a good sense, though, to keep the entrails for bait, and so they then began to catch some fish, and that got them through. But on they went for week after week until the Air Force was going to give up the search because they don't search. They have a certain amount of time. That's two weeks, I think, is it. And Mrs. Rickenbacker stormed down from New York to Washington and stormed into Hap Arnold's office. He's the head of the Air Force, and don't you dare give up this search. And so they put it on for another week or however long it was, and suddenly one of these search planes looked down, and he saw the saw these life rafts. Saw one of the life rafts anyway. They, they, they got them, finally, they, you know, emaciated and sunburned, horribly sunburned and water, you know, the sores that you get when you're in that kind of situation. But Rickenbacker spent a week putting himself back together, and then he flew on back to New, out to New Guinea to give MacArthur his message. He was tough. So again, it's that tenacity, tenacity that he, they had from the get-go. And he was, again, he was in his 40s when this was going on, too. Oh, he was in his 50s. 50s, okay. I, think, I, believe, I believe he was in his, in his, his 50s. early 50s. Right, and again, like, he, not mistaken. he didn't have to do this. He could have been just enjoying the Oh, no, the he didn't life. have to do it. Right. And he kept on going, and he, he, he would go out to North Africa. His, his solid job, they offered him a rank of, of lieutenant general, and he said, no, I don't want that. He said, I'm going to be Captain Eddie. So I don't want to get in the military with all that hierarchy. People, even lieutenant generals have people telling them what to do. He said, I'm going to do it my way. And his job was sort of, a, he would go out to these various pilots units, and these were all young pilots. I mean, they weren't professional pilots. Um, they, they were young men in their 20s who had taken a pilot training. But he was, you know, Rickenbacker, was, he was one of the gods, like the little in, in Lindbergh. And he would go there to various bases and, and give up. He, he knew how to give a pep talk. He was very adept at that. Well, uh, let's talk about Lindbergh, because he is an interesting case, because it took him a while 
to come to this country service during World War II. Both uh, Rickenbacker and Doolittle, even before World War II, were making a big push for aviation in the military, which kind of fell on deaf ears until Pearl Harbor. So can you talk a little bit about Lindbergh and why it took him a bit to come to his country's aid? Yeah. he Well, you know, he was a colonel by that time in the, in the, uh, the Army, and he was then on the reserve list. He wasn't active. He, he was very much opposed to the U.S. entry into World War II. And I think that some of that was a product of his upbringing as a, essentially an isolationist. And that sprang from World War I, where we sent, you know, two or three million troops to France, to Europe, and had 50,000 of them killed. And what, 20 years later, they had it again. And the isolationist movement was very strong. Lindbergh's father was a great isolationist. Um, he just said, let Europe have its own problems. We don't need it. And so he joined an organization called America First. Rickenbacker was in the same organization for a long time. And it said, basically, it's America First. And what, what that meant was that they said, spend their defense money, but spend it on defense of this country so that if Germany does, in fact, which it, it appeared, this uh, if you look now, we're talking 1939, 40, 41. It appeared that Germany was going to take over all of Europe. From 39 on, early 40 on, Great Britain was the only ally there was uh, at all. The rest of them had been conquered, France and all the lowland countries and Scandinavia. Everybody was under the thumb of the Germans, except for, for the Soviet Union. And Lindbergh had been there a number of times, been to Germany, been to, to Great Britain. And he was of the opinion, looking at the German Air Force, that they were far superior to anything that Great Britain had. He became one of the major spokesmen for this America First, which infuriated Roosevelt, President Roosevelt. And Roosevelt had cast doubts on his loyalty because, of course, he was of German extraction. And that caused Lindbergh to renounce his colonelcy in the Army. He said, I can't serve for a man who thinks I'm disloyal. And he, of course, he wasn't disloyal. In any case, when the war came, when we got into war at Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had a long memory, and Lindbergh had gone back and begged. I always say begged, but he, he asked very politely. He'd like to have his commission back. And the word came everywhere, no. And it not only came his commission, but even where he worked, he wanted to work in aviation, and wherever he worked, the Roosevelt administration had threatened to pull the government contracts from his companies. And the only person that he, that Roosevelt couldn't stand up to was Henry Ford, who at that point had the largest aircraft manufacturing operation in the world at Willow Run, making warplanes. And so they hired Lindbergh on as he was a technician, he was a technician, he was essentially a test pilot. And he did things that very few pilots, with the exception, say, of Doolittle, would have done. I mean, the high altitude stuff and pushing the limits on planes. And finally, in 1943, I believe it was, he went to Henry Ford and said, look, I've done all I can do here with testing these aircraft. He said, I need to go and test them under the conditions on which they were designed, meaning combat conditions. And in particular, he wanted to test two airplanes. They did the Navy had a single engine fighter plane that they used off aircraft carriers and, and off the islands with the Marine Corps. And the Army was using a twin engine plane, a P-40. It's two booms, and it's a funny-looking thing, but that's what the Army was using MacArthur. And so, indeed, he did. He went out, and they gave him a... There was a special kind of designation. They gave me what... He was neither fish nor fowl. He was. He dressed up with an officer's uniform, and he ate in the officer's mess, and he was accorded the officer's privileges, very much like a newspaper reporter, but he was essentially a technician. And so he went to of all places, Guadalcanal, and studied planes. And these were Navy planes. And uh, he then went up island to Bougainville and all those places. He flew with some of, with Foss, who was the most famous Marine Corps ace in World War II. And he started flying combat missions with them, and they all liked him. So he's a good guy. 
and uh, he gave him a lot of good tips and things. He was, again, the most famous aviator of his age. Not to be outdone, he then went to New Guinea, and he started flying with these guys, and they said he flew with the best-known air group that was, I can't remember the name of it, 434th or something like that, but he, he walked into the pilot shack there, and there was the commander who was probably in his 20s, he was a colonel, and he said who he was, and the guy was playing checkers. He walked in behind him, he said who he was and what he wanted. He said, I want to fly with your group and study your aircraft. And the guy sort of waved him off, and so he waited for about four, five, six minutes, and finally the, the colonel said, now what, what did you say your name was and what did you want? Again, and he told him his name, and he told him what he wanted, and the guy turned around, he said, not Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> My God. And so he became ingratiated with this group. And he began flying these combat missions. And he showed them something that they didn't know, how to change the mixture of the fuel that would give them an extra 600-mile range. Everybody was extremely appreciative of this because that was part of the problem with these islands being distant. You know, MacArthur was moving up from New Guinea toward the Philippines and later Japan, in order to send his, his bombers, his B-17 bombers, they needed escorts. And the fighters just didn't have the fuel range. Well, suddenly Lindbergh had given him a range, and then one day a notice comes to him to immediately report to MacArthur's headquarters, and he figures he's in for it, uh, because he's not supposed to be flying with these people. He's a technician. And certainly he's also Lindbergh. He was in Nathmar Roosevelt. So he goes to MacArthur's headquarters, and MacArthur greets him like a long-lost brother. And he told him he's given him this enormous range that they get 600 more miles. That's coming and going, a 300-mile range, I guess. And they could fly there and fly back there. Uh, 600 miles of flying time, I meant to say. But anyway, he continued to do that and actually flew more missions, and he's shot down a Jap Zero and almost got shot down himself and he flew more than was required by the army and then he came home so he'd done his duty that's funny he found a way to serve yeah so and I'm curious as you were researching and writing about these men did you pick up any life lessons that you think men today can take from well yeah and you do it in all the histories that I've written I mean it's perseverance it's somehow the ability to put your own life on the line, the ability to, to somehow conquer fear, put the fear, compartmentalize it, put it somewhere else, because all these things require a certain amount of fortitude. And once you conquer that, once you get that under control, then it's perseverance, because none of these things are easy that these guys did. I mean, you think of Doolittle putting himself in that situation he's, where well, he's got a canvas cover over his cockpit, he can't see anything but the instrument panel is looking right at him. That's all he can see. And he's going to take that thing up in the air that way? I mean, that required a lot of fortitude, but also, it took him years. I, I can't remember not many, many years, because he had a lot of, of help from the Bureau of Standards and other things. But they, they perfected these instruments. I mean, he went out to the finest watchmakers and other people who knew how to do precision instruments and make them small and precise. It was a big risk, but it was also the years that it took him to get those things just right. And the same thing was true for Lindbergh. I mean, all these guys were, there's a very thin margin in aviation between life and death. My conversation with my friend, the fighter pilot, last night, he'd just been in Afghanistan. And it's, it's very thin. And a lot of unknowables, like who's going to shoot at you, you know, either, oh, and when. But you, those, those are risks that you take. It goes with the territory. These, these guys were willing to take the risk and willing to put their lives on the line, but they were also very smart guys who had a, a great instincts for self-preservation, but also great instincts as to what it took to be an American. And I think that that is a trait that is, not necessarily unique to this country, but it's unique to a lot more people in this country and it seems to be any other place in the world. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, Winston Groom, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. 
My guest today was Winston Groom. He's the author of several books. Go to Amazon.com, search Winston Groom. You're going to find all sorts of great books. He's got a ton of them on there, including history books and historical fiction. You can find more information about his work at WinstonGroom.com. The book we talked about today was Aviators, and his latest historical fiction book is El Paso. So go check that out. Also, check out our show notes at AOM.is slash aviators, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. If you enjoy this show, I'd appreciate if you take one or two minutes to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Cat, whatever it is you use to listen to podcasts, please give us a review. That helps us out a lot. As always, thank you for your continued support. Until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Mm -hmm.